Good morning po sa lahat ng criminology students sa Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao region. In today's episode, what we are going to do is to discuss or review one of the subjects under the major area of forensic science, specifically forensic chemistry and toxicology. Now to start with, let us first differentiate forensic chemistry and forensic science. So as you can see on your screen, the definition of forensic chemistry refers to the branch of chemistry which deals with the application of chemical principles in the solution of problems that arise in connection with the administration of justice. While on the other hand, forensic science is the use of science and technology to enforce civil and criminal laws. Take note, cadets, that there are a lot of subjects under forensic science. Say, for example, you can take a look at dactyloscopy or fingerprint identification as one of the sciences under forensic science. You also have uh, police photography. You have question document examination. So all of this belongs to forensic science. So when what when we say forensic science, that refers to the applications of science, the applications of the application of science and technology in law enforcement, in criminal investigation, or in criminal justice. While we say forensic chemistry, forensic chemistry is just one of the branches of forensic science because in forensic chemistry, what is being studied would be the chemicals, okay? Different chemicals as applied to criminal investigation. So if a person will, let us say, um, will utilize chemical process, for example, in the examination of blood, okay? Utilize chemicals in the examination of blood. So in that case, such study or such field belongs to what we call as forensic chemistry. Again, forensic science is an application of science and technology in criminal investigation or in the enforcement of civil and criminal laws. And one of the branches of forensic sciences would be forensic chemistry. We have a lot of forensic sciences. Again, we have question document examination. We have uh, dactyloscopy. We have legal medicine. All of these are under what we call as forensic science. Now, to further understand the nature of forensic chemistry and toxicology, let us go now to the scope or the coverage of forensic chemistry. Now, number one is that it includes chemical side of crim criminal investigation. So, as I have said a while ago, if you will examine the blood specimen to find out whether that specimen belongs to the suspect, or whether that blood specimen belongs to the victim. Such process includes forensic chemistry. Why? Because you will utilize chemicals in the, in the determination thereof. Aside from that, it includes the analysis of any material, the quality of which may give rise to legal proceeding. So, for example, on the case of rape, determining whether the semen belongs really to the suspect that is something that will provide quality, a material evidence that will actually help the, uh, the, the criminal case to, to be solved in order for the legal proceeding to prosper. The third one is that it has invaded other branches of forensic sciences, notably legal medicine, ballistics, question document examination, dactyloscopy, and photography. By the way, guys, when we say dactyloscopy again, it refers to the science of fingerprint identification. The question right now is, how does forensic chemistry overlap with these allied sciences? Now, if, let us say for example, we take a look on examination of the hands of the suspect to know whether the hands of the suspect contains gunshot residue. Now, in the determination whether there is a presence of nitrates or gunshot residue, you have to utilize the phenylamine test or paraffin test. And paraffin test 
will utilize, on the other hand, will utilize chemical processes. Or it will use chemicals in the determination whether the person has gunshot residue. So in that case, since it involves chemical processes already, even though it is part of ballistics, again, ang forensic chemistry has a role to take. Okay? Now, if you will go to question document examination, knowing whether a particular handwriting belongs to the person who claims to own the document, again, you will utilize chemicals, okay? In the examination thereof. Since you utilize chemicals, again, you implement or you utilize, uh, you include forensic chemistry in that field. If you will go to fingerprint identification, again, fingerprint identification, you utilize chemicals in the examination of fingerprints. So in that case, still, forensic chemistry is a parcel on the study thereof. So, even if it is legal medicine, ballistics, question documents, dactyloscopy or photography, still, forensic chemistry and toxicology has a part on that allied sciences. Now, in criminal investigation, of course, the things that will be examined, okay, the specimens that will be examined under forensic chemistry would be the physical evidences. Of course, we have a lot of physical evidences that we can retrieve coming from the crime scene. Meron po tayong blood. We can have uh, semen. We can have the hair of a person. We can have um, we can have the DNA of the indi individual. These are all physical evidences, okay? And the physical evidences will be the subject, okay? Will be the subject for the chemical examination. So, what are what is the definition of physical evidence? So, this is just a sort of review, cadets. So, what is physical evidence? These are articles and materials which are found in connection with an investigation and which aid, okay, which aid in establishing the identity of the perpetrator or the circumstances under which the crime was committed, which in general assist in the prosecution of the criminal. So, meaning... Physical evidence is something, something that is tangible, okay? Something that can be touched, like say blood, semen, okay? This can, these evidences can aid in knowing who is the perpetrator of the crime. For example, on the case of rape, okay? On the case of rape, examination of the semen, even though the, 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 the lady, or even though the victim does not know the identity of the person, but if there is the presence of the semen, semen is a prima facie evidence that can actually pinpoint the identity of the criminal. So, it is a physical evidence. Now, in your fundamentals of criminal investigation subject, I think your professor already mentioned about types of physical evidences. Tatlo lang po yan, mga, mga, mga cadets. Tatlo lang yan. Number one, corpus delicti, Pangalawa, associative evidence. Pangatlo, tracing evidence. These are the only three types of physical evidences. There are a lot of types of uh, there are a lot of uh, classes of of evidences like real evidence, documentary evidences, testimonial evidences. But then again, we will focus first on the types of physical evidences. Tatlo lang po. Ona, corpus delicti. Pangalawa, associative evidence. Pangatlo is tracing evidence. Now. What is a corpus delicti? A corpus delicti, as some of the criminology students will, will usually interpret it, this refers to the body of the crime. The question right now is, what is the interpretation of the phrase body of the crime? Second question is, does this mean or does the word body refers to the literal body of a person? So let us understand what is really corpus delicti. So when we say body of the crime, this does not mainly mean the literal body of the victim or the literal body of the suspect. Okay? When we say body of the crime, this refers to a particular evidence sufficient enough to prove that a crime exists. I repeat, the word body in corpus delicti refers to evidences that will sufficiently prove 
that the crime or that a crime exists. For example, on the case of burglary, okay? On the case of burglary or the the unauthorized entry on a particular building. So when you say burglary, one of the corpus delicti thereof could have been the broken window or the broken doorknob. So the broken doorknob or the broken window is something that would prove, evidences that would prove that there is burglary. So you do not need the dead body of the person because the crime that you want to prove is burglary. And burglary does not involve dead body. It only involves, like say, for example, evidences that will prove that there is illegal entry. So the, 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 the destroyed doorknob, the broken window, would indicate that there is burglary that an indication that a person wanted to wanted to commit illegal entry on a particular building if the crime is robbery if the crime is robbery then one of the corpus delicti evidences to prove that there is robbery would be the materials being stolen am i correct the materials being stolen not the dead body because the crime that you want to prove is robbery not murder of course if you want to prove Murder or homicide, that's the time that you have to take a look at the literal dead body of a person to prove that there is murder or there is homicide being committed. But again, when we say corpus delicti, it does not refer literally to the dead body of the person, but rather it means or it refers to evidences that will prove that a particular crime exists or a particular crime being committed. Okay? I hope you understand. Now, let us go to associative evidence. This came out in, I, I can still remember, in 2010, Criminology Licensure Examination. The question was, what is, what type of physical evidence is fingerprint or Latin print? The answer should be, associative evidence okay semen is an associative evidence blood is an associative evidence these are pieces of evidences that will link the suspect to the crime scene tracing evidence on the other hand are articles which assist the investigator in locating the criminal stolen goods in the position of the suspect is an example of tracing evidence for example if the crime is theft and the material that is being stolen is a cell phone, and the cell phone was found to be in the position of the suspect, the cell phone is a tracing evidence. On the case of rape, for example, rape, huh? on the case of rape, like the pubic hair of the victim is found at the garments of the suspect, of the clothings of the suspect, then the hair in that instance or in that context can be considered as a tracing evidence. If a particular crime uh, happens in, in, in one location and the soil from that location was imprinted on the shoes of the suspect, so the soil, the soil uh, on, the shoes, uh, on the shoes of the suspect can be considered as a tracing evidence. So, uh, the, these, are, oh, these are the differences between corpus delicti, associative, and tracing evidence. So, since again, in forensic chemistry and toxicology, we will be dealing with physical uh, evidences that will be subject for chemical processes. So, we'll be going now to various uh, Various specimens that can be found at the crime scene that will be subject for laboratory examination, particularly uh, under forensic chemistry. So we will start with the blood, okay? The blood. So again, in this in this course of discussion, I'll be mentioning. We'll just acquit ourselves with the different chemical processes per specimen or per physical evidence. So the first physical evidence that we'll be studying would be the blood. So again, the blood has been called as the circulating tissue of the body. Uh, it is referred to as highly complex mixtures of cells, enzymes, proteins, inorganic substances. Blood is opaque. On treatment with water or other regions, it becomes transparent and assumes lake color. It is faintly 
alkaline. So this is the generic um, definition of blood. So blood is something that is circulated with within the body of the person. So if the crime involves, let us say, physical injuries, murder, homicide, usually these crimes involves blood specimen as one of the evidences that can be that can be examined. So let us go now to the importance of the study of blood. Take a look on the picture. Okay? Long pants coming from the victim. So the blood that is uh, stained, the long pants blemished with spots of blood, could be something that can be used as evidence in the court in the form of circumstantial or corroborative evidence of the crime. Now let us let us differentiate the two. What is circumstantial evidence? What is corroborative evidence? When we say circumstantial evidences or evidence, this refers to a type of evidence that consists events or circumstances. Okay? Events or circumstances. For example, for example, kailan po maging, maging circumstantial evidence ang blood? For example, if a particular eyewitness so Juan de la Cruz being stained with blood while running coming uh, while ra- running from the crime scene okay Juan de la Cruz being stained with blood while running from the crime scene even though Juan de la Cruz did not did not see in plain view the killing of the victim but he knows but taking in, but taking into point that he saw with his in, in his plain eyes that Juan de la Cruz was actually running from the crime scene stained with blood. In that case, the blood could be a circumstantial evidence that will prove or that will help to prove that it was Juan de la Cruz who perhaps perpetuated the crime. So, circumstantial evidence. When we say corroborative evidence, this is actually a separate evidence that could support another evidence. Okay? An evidence that could support another evidence. So, blood can also be considered as a corroborative evidence. Next, another importance of the study of blood would be in the case of disputed parentage. Take note that uh, the blood type of the mother plus the blood type or combined with the blood type of the father will result to a specific blood type that will be uh, that will be uh, will be endowed to the child so um, later on we will take a look on the combination of blood types between the mother and the father and what would be the specific blood type that will be genetically passed to to the child so for disputed parentage examination of blood can also be very important another is as evidence in the determination of the cause of death and the length of time the victim survived the attack, determination of the direction of escape of the victim or the assailant. So again, number one is that blood can also be used in finding out the cause of death. Like say for example, you want to examine whether the blood contains toxin. Or poison. So examination thereof, if you if you find out that the blood contains poison, maybe one of the prognosis that you can draw is that the victim died because of poisoning. Blood can also be considered in determining the possible length of time the victim survived the attack. Because if the blood is still fresh, then it is an indication that the crime happened not long before you arrived. Uh, inside the crime scene or at the crime scene so blood can be can also be one of the bases again on the determination of direction of the escape of the victim or of the assailant the blood spots okay in your fundamentals of criminal investigation you were taught by your professor that the blood spots could actually pinpoint the direction of escape the direction of the escape of the victim or the direction of escape of the assailant so if you can see blood spots coming from point A to point B. So that means the person is having a direction, possibly of escape, from point A to point B because the blood spots tells you that it is the direction or it's the point of direction of the victim. So if, let us say, on the case of um, 
uh, theft with homicide or robbery with uh, robbery with homicide so the blood the blood of the victim will indicate his direction when the crime happened so if the victim escaped from the room from the room towards the window so the blood spot the blood spots might be located from that exact position point of the room to the window okay so again this is also one of the importance of studying the blood now just to just to review this may sound not very important but we will just uh, reacquaint ourselves with the composition of blood okay so the blood consists of water and the solid part the water is 90% the solid part is just only 10% take note of that 90% water solid is 10% now in that 100% of blood 45% 45% belongs to the elements such as red blood cells white blood cells or blood platelets or thrombocytes. Again, just to review, ha, cadets, red blood cells is also known as erythrocytes. White blood cells is also known as leukocytes. Blood platelets is also known as thrombocytes. So again, 45% consists of the, the RBC, the WBC, and the blood platelets. The remaining 55% would be on the plasma what is a plasma a plasma is the fluid or liquid portion of blood where the cells are suspended so if you can take a look on if you take a look on the picture you can see the the area consisting of the plasma the liquefied portion of the blood now plasma is different from serum okay because serum will actually occur uh when clot uh, serum is a straw yellow colored liquid formed when clotted blood is allowed to stand for some time and clot contracts that means when a particular blood is clotted okay left after several you know after several couple of minutes or hours the yellow colored will be the liquefied yellow color would be the serum the serum will only occur when the blood clots while plasma whether there is clotting or not, plasma is still part of the blood, which is 55%. Now, to fully understand the difference between plasma and serum, I, I really uh, include here in the picture so that you will really have an easy understanding on the differences between the two because usually this is one of the most confusing topics when we study about blood, especially for, you know, criminology enthusiasts or criminology students. Now, Fibrinogen is a glycoprotein complex made in the liver that circulates in the blood of all vertebrates. Fibrin clots function primarily to occlude blood vessels to stop the bleeding. Okay? To stop the bleeding. Now, if a particular sample or specimen contains fibrinogen, okay contains fibrinogen such shall be part of what we call as plasma so these are two blood samples okay if it contains again fibrinogen fibrinogen again is a glycoprotein complex made in the liver if it contains fibrinogen yellow color plasma on the other side okay on the other side on the other vial the serum has no fibrinogen when the blood clots okay when the blood clots and there is no fibrinogen it shall be considered as a serum okay so i hope you understand now the differences between the two the plasma and the serum now let us take a look on the place of collection the question is where are you going or where would be the best spots for the blood samples uh, can be collected Okay, so where can you collect uh, ideally the, the blood samples? So, on the place of collection, the fluid blood can be collected on the victims of crimes of violence like murder, homicide, 
in the case of parents and child in case of disputed parentage for uh, on the case of let us say knowing whether the child really belongs to the father by bone by blood or by flesh so what you need to do is take the sample coming from the father take the blood sample coming from the father and conduct chemical processes so asa nimo i-collect o gikan sa ginikanan from the parents alone on the case of violence like murder or homicide you take the blood sample coming from the victims in the case of dried blood or blood stains it can be collected from the walls floors table tops surface like uh, hard surface like axe hammer knives if these things are used in the commission of the crime glazed surface like glass tiles automobiles bulky objects like blackboard sheets doors windows frames clothing blood absorbed by the soil all of this can be uh, can be the places the ideal place the collection of dried blood okay so the bottom line is if a particular crime happened in that specific place then your subject for examination of knowing the place of collection should be that should be should be that specific place so if it happens in room in room a so the blood should be perhaps be present in one of the areas in room a now since forensic chemistry and toxicology mainly involves on the application of chemical processes to criminal investigation we will acquaint ourselves okay we will acquaint ourselves with the four chronological tests for blood so all of this you know all of these tests all of these four tests involve um, cre- uh, chemical processes okay involves chemical processes the first one is preliminary test okay so it's a chronological test this is arranged and this should be performed in chronological order hindi po pwedeng you go directly to blood typing you have to start you have to start from the first second third and the fourth so the first one is preliminary test second one is confirmatory test if you are done with confirmatory test you proceed now to the third test which is precipitant test and if you are done with the precipitant test that's the time that you have to move to blood grouping or typing okay the first is preliminary the last to be blood grouping and typing take note that in in preliminary test there are a couple or there are many tests that can be performed under that specific examination but let us go first let us find out first the purpose of preliminary test the purpose of the preliminary test is to find out the presence of blood to blood to find out whether a particular specimen is really a blood okay because not all red color fluid coming from the crime scene can be considered as a blood who knows wala takabalo it is just a ketchup diba spilled on the crime scene so an a ketchup can be you know has has a appearance of the blood so you have to know whether a particular specimen or evidence is really blood and one of that is preliminary test now in the preliminary test it involves number one benzadine test you can all of this can be performed or even one of these can be performed if you want to utilize benzadine test to find out if whether it is blood what happen is once you perform this you will know that it is positive or the evidence is positive of blood once there is blue specks that occur okay blue specks so as you can see on your screen can you take a look on the picture ito po na blue color is an indication na positive po yan positive po ang isang specimen for blood if you will perform penoptalin test or the castle mayor test what happen is dili blue color hindi po blue color uh, ang mo ang mo appear But rather, what appears would be the rose color or the deep pink or permanganate color. Okay? So as you can see on your screen, if it is rose color, deep pink, okay, this one, positive for blood. Pero if you perform the penoptalin test 
but it so happened that the cotton okay that you cotton that you uh, uh the, the cotton that you submerge to that specimen is still white then that is an indication that the white color is a negative for blood the third one would be the the guacum test or the vanden or days or Sean Bien test. I don't know if this is the correct pronunciation, but uh, if in case you perform the guacom test, the beautiful blue color will occur that would indicate that a particular specimen is positive of blood. The question right now is what's the difference between the color of the benzodine and the guacom test? So if you will compare on the figure, the benzodine test consists of an intense, okay, intense blue color. Now aside from the three, Okay, aside from the three preliminary tests, you can also perform leukomalahide test. Okay, leukomalahide test. And in the leukomalahide test, what appears would be the bluish green. Okay, the bluish green, as you can see on your screen. If it is a luminal test, you can say luminescence. Alright, luminescence. So in luminescence, you can see that the blood specimen coming from the crime scene will actually glow. Okay, uh, actually glow. Uh, especially if the area that you want to examine is a dark area or a dark room. So you can use luminol chemical and then once there is luminescence, meaning it glow, okay, it glows, so automatically that would be an indication that that specimen is blood. Take note, oxidation is the principle involved in the color formation of the preliminary test for blood except in luminol test. Okay? Meaning that transformation from red color to a specific color, whether it is a pink rose, whether it is blue, intense blue, or beautiful blue, or green, the transformation thereof, the process is known as oxidation. Okay? Well, when we say peroxid peroxidase, this refers to the enzyme that accelerates the oxidation of several classes classes of organic compounds by peroxide. So meaning the peroxidase helps the oxidation process. But then again, the transformation or the process of transformation from red color of the blood to a specific color, we call it as oxidation. Now, even if you already know that in the preliminary test, the specimen is found to be blood, you have to be sure, okay? You need to be sure that that specimen is really 100% a blood specimen and for you to do that is you need to conduct what we call as confirmatory test again the purpose the purpose of confirmatory test is to find out the actual proof that a stain is really a blood specimen to confirm based on preliminary test to confirm that the stain or the specimen is really blood now in confirmatory test there is uh, there are actually processes okay there are actually processes i believe there are three okay i believe there are three processes that have to be uh, performed okay that have to be performed in order to find out whether a particular stain is really blood number one is microscopic test the second one is microchemical or microcrystalline test and the third one would be the spectroscopic examination. So we will study this one uh, one by one. Okay, we will study the three one by one. Now the purpose of microscopic test is number one, useful for the demonstration and mensuration of blood corpuscles. Number two, distinction between the mammalian and reptilian blood. Okay, distinction between the mammalian and reptilian blood. You have to find out whether that blood belongs to a reptile, okay, belongs to a reptile, or it belongs to the human being. Blood can be, can be, can vary from one, uh, one specimen to the other. It may be blood, but that blood may come from animals. So you have to find out. So in order to provide distinction thereof, you have to, uh, you have to perform microscopic tests. The third one is investigation of menstrual local we say local this refers to blood during birth or nasal charges so you have to find out if you are very sure that the specimen is blood find out 
Whether that blood comes from the menstruation, especially for the ladies. Okay? Menstruation. Because the blood uh, from the lady could be one of the uh, evidences that can help, you know, uh, determine justice, especially on the crime of rape. So find out whether the blood comes from menstruation or from birth. Okay? So when, when the mother will deliver a child, so during birth, usually there is a presence of blood. So find out if it is from local or from nasal charges, okay? From the nose, okay? Or find out whether the blood comes directly coming from the wound of the person. Now, aside from the microscopic test, okay? If you are done with the microscopic test, you have to perform microchemical or microcrystalline test. This test consists of three. Number one is Tickman test or hemin crystal test. By the way, cadets, I just want you to familiarize, all right? Just familiarize. We will not be, you know, doing the actual test in this episode. But what we're going to do is just acquaint yourselves, familiarize with the different tests because this will surely come out in the criminology licensure examination. So please, please acquaint yourselves with this test. So in the microchemical again or microcrystalline test, we have three. Number one is the Tickman test or the Hemin test. Uh, human crystal test. Uh, an indication that it is positive for blood is the dark brown rhombic crystal or hematin chloride. So I already include a figure that shows the positive results of blood. So this is the color for Tickman test. For hemo for hemochromogen crystal test or the Takayama test, you can see large rhombic crystals of salmon pink. As indicated on the figure that you can see in your screen, the salmon pink is an indication that there is positive confirmed siyang blood. The last one will be the acetone hemin test. The small dark diachronic acicular crystals of acetone hemin is an indication that this is positive of blood. So the difference between the two, between Tickman test and the acetone hemin test, mas dark color ang Tickman test compared to the acetone human test now aside from again aside from the microscopic test and the microchemical or microcrystalline test we have the most delicate okay delicate the most delicate and the most reliable test to confirm that a particular state is really a blood so what is the name of the examination spectroscopic examination wherein the, the computer or the microscope known as the computer and of course the microscope known as spectroscopy uh, as spectroscopic mic, uh, microscope can be utilized or will be utilized in this procedure. Now I mentioned a while ago under microscopic test that uh, one of the usefulness thereof would be the determination whether the blood is mammalian or reptilian in nature. So after the uh, preliminary test you proceed with the of course confirmatory test you now proceed with the third one which is precipitant test again in precipitant test you take a look just like in a microscopic test you take a look whether that particular blood specimen really comes from human or animal okay you have to examine whether it is human or animal in origin now, if human blood, the positive result is a white cloudy line or milky precipitate at the contact point of the fluids, as you can see on, as you can see on the image that is reflected on your screen. Now, the question is, how is precipitant test, um, precipitant test performed? Now, in a precipitant test, take note, serum made in rabbit contains antibodies against human blood. So, crime scene blood is layered on top of the anti-human serum in a test tube. Okay? So, gitipon. Okay? You you include or you um, integrate the serum coming from the rabbit and the blood sample coming from the crime scene. If the sample is positive for human blood, a cloudy precipitate will form where the two layers meet. So, as you can see, human blood at the top Anti-human bodies coming from the rabbit below. Okay. Once you once there is a reaction, chemical reaction between the two, you can see 
you can actually see a cloudy, right? In this corner, cloudy uh, precipitation that occurs that would indicate that the uh, that the uh, that the blood sample is really a human blood. Now, after the precipitin test, the last one would be the blood grouping typing. Diba? We already done with preliminary test, confirmatory test, the precipitin test. The last one would be blood grouping and typing. As I have said a while ago, um, blood could be a good evidence to prove whether a particular child belongs to the father or where that where the particular child belongs to the mother so in case of disputed parentage this could be this could be very useful so we only have four basic blood groups okay the type a blood type b blood a b type o plus or o type now you can see the agglutinogens you can also see the agglutinins but i will focus only on the father's blood type and the mother's blood type and what would be the result thereof now let us say for example okay let us say for example we will examine this one this corner if the mother's blood type is a okay type a ang, ang mother tapos yung ama the father is also type a in that case the result would be the child will have a type A or a type O blood type. Okay? Type A or type of blood type. If in case the child has blood uh, blood type which is B, B blood type, so that is an indication that there is something wrong. Because as stated, okay, as stated, if the mother is having a blood type of A and the father is blood type of A, of course, the result will only be A or type O. Now, if the mother has a blood type of A, the father is blood type of B, this will be the result, A, B, A, B, or O. If the mother's blood type is uh, A and the father is A, B, the result would be blood type A, B, or A, B. If the mother's blood type is A and the father's blood type is O, the result would be A or O. Same thing goes with B, A, B, O, blood type coming from the mother you can actually use this table to find out uh, the result the blood endowments coming from the parents so on the last corner or on the last or on the bottom part uh, this is the last example that i will give if your mother's blood type is o but your father is a the result would be a or o if your mother's blood type is uh, o and your father is blood type uh, b the result will be B or O. Same thing goes with A, B, and uh, O in this corner. So that's how you will determine whether the child really belongs to the father or belongs to the mother. So those are the chemical processes. Okay, the chemical processes that uh, are involved in the examination of blood. Okay, in the examination of blood. Now, we will go now, or we will now proceed to another physical evidence that can be subject for forensic chemistry or chem uh, chemistry examination, okay? Chemical examination rather, chemical examination in the laboratory. So the next physical evidence is the semen. The question is, how important is semen, okay? Now, semen can be a prima facie evidence to prove that there is rape being committed okay being committed by the suspect but first we will determine first the nature of the semen so a semen is a viscid whitish fluid of the male reproductive tract consisting of spermatozoa suspended in secretion of axi accessory glands i believe the boys who are already matured enough this is a very mature topic actually, cadets. But for the mature, you know, mature male persons, I believe uh, all of you already witnessed, already see uh, what semen looks like. Okay, what semen looks like. Now, the semen of the male uh, person consists of various parts. Okay, consists of various parts. Number one, the seminal fluid Number two, the form cellular, cellular elements. I repeat, the seminal fluid 
and the form cellular, cellular elements. Now, the cellular elements consist of three. Number one is the sperm cells. Okay? The sperm cells or the spermatozoa. The second one is epithelial cells and the third one would be the crystals or the colon and lysithin. So these are the cellular elements of the semen. But actually, there are only two major parts. Again, seminal and the form cellular elements. The cellular elements consist of the three, the sperm cells, epithelial cells, and the crystals of colon and lysithin. Now, ang sperm cells normally in one ejaculation. Sir, an ano bang ibig sabihin ng ejaculation? What do you mean by ejaculation? When you say ejaculation, that means the climax. Alright? The climax where you, will you, where you release the sperm cells. Okay? okay? Where, will, uh, where you release the sperm cells. So, when you ejaculate, the normal count should be 400 to 500 million of sperm cells in just one ejaculation. And take note, there is only one sperm that will only reach the, the egg cell of the woman. So, out of the 500 million, only one that will survive. So, imagine. Imagine the mystery of reproduction. Diba, boys? Imagine the mystery of reproduction. So, the sperm cell in just one ejaculation. So, if you if you bring your, you know, if, if if you are on a honeymoon, if you are on a honeymoon and you ejaculate, let us say, five times, so you multiply 400 or 500 million to five. And that's the number of sperms that that you release. But again, the the point of inquiry here would be on uh, utilizing semen specimen in knowing the identity of the person or the identity of the criminal. Now, in the image that you can see on your screen you can see the parts okay basically the parts of the sperm you can see you can see the head right this portion uh, the nucleus the mitochondria you can see the tail right this is how this uh, sperm cell um, looks like when a part, when a semen is subjected to uh, spectroscopy or or a microscope so you can this is the same you know likeness with uh, you know with the sperm cell that you can see on the microscope now let us go now to the cases wherein semen has no spermatozoa so there are like, actually a lot of cases especially for couples who cannot bear children or who cannot reproduce so for the male persons there might be physical abnormalities number one Aspermia, or whether number two, the person might be suffering from oligospermia. By the way, take note of the terms, cadets. This is very important. Ang aspermia is a puyang condition wherein the male person has no sperm. Okay? Has no sperm. They have seminal fluid, like they ejaculated. You can see the the seminal fluid flowing out from the sexual organ of the male person. But if you examine the, the fluid e extracted or ejaculated coming from the male person, you cannot see sperm cells. Okay? You cannot see sperm cells. When you subject it for microscope, all you can see are fluids, but no sperm cells. Ang tawag po dyan, aspermia. If in case, if in case, you examine the fluid and you can see sperms. But the sperms are not that enough or does not reach the normal count. Again, the normal count should be 400 to 500 million per ejaculation. And you can only see hundreds or couples of sperm cells swimming on the fluids. In that case, the person is suffering from what we call as oligospermia. Okay? Oligospermia, there are sperm cells, but it does not reach the normal count. A spermia, nigh fluid, but you cannot see the sperm cells. That's the difference between a spermia and oligospermia. Now, in case of semen or location of the semen, if you want to find out the fresh, okay, fresh specimen, fresh semen, 
you can take a look at the vaginal contents of the victim. Especially, I'm, I'm talking about, let us be matured in here. I'm talking about the rape victim. So you take a look possibly on the labia menorah or the vaginal lips of the or the vaginal part of the victim and you can see the fresh you know fresh semen or on the rectal contents of the what is rectal that rectal means on the anus part okay because the anus part and the vaginal parts of the sexual uh, of, of of the of the female individual are actually interconnected or adjacent with each other so it might be in the vaginal Uh, contents or vaginal areas or on the rectal areas of the victim where you can find the fresh semen. But uh, the semen can be found as wet or dried condition secretion on the pubic hair. The pubic hair would refer to, you can see the, the, the hair uh, uh, sprouting uh, on the side of the sexual organ of the person. It can also be found on the skin around the genitals. I'm talking again, cadets, on rape cases. Now, semen can be found as dry stains on underclothing or on the underwear of the male or the female person. Or on the bed sheets or the bed, the bed clothing. Or maybe on a piece of cloth that is used to wipe the evidence. You can find the, the, you know, the dried stains in that, in that location. Now, as forensic chemistry dictates, let us go now to the different examinations that can be conducted to find out whether a particular specimen is really a semen. There are actually four uh, examinations being involved therein. Number one is physical examination. Okay? The physical examination. You can actually know, especially for the boys, You will actually know the odor, the texture of the semen. Okay? So you can actually um, have the inferential analysis that this specimen can be or could be a semen. So number one is physical examination. So what you can see on your screen are actually pictures that reflects, you know, semen coming from the crime scene. Now, To make sure that a particular specimen is really a semen, you now conduct what we call a chemical examination. Now, with the chemical examination, familiarize yourselves with this criminology students. Familiarize yourselves with the test. Number one is Lorenz test. Two is Barberius test. Number three is acid phosphatase test. Now, in the Florence test, you can see that a particular specimen has a color of dark brown rhombic or needle shaped as you can see on your screen that would indicate that that specimen is really a seminal stain if you conduct the barbarous test you can see slender yellow tinted rhomboid needles shape okay shape uh Uh, in the micros uh, in the in the result of the barbarous test that will indicate that that uh, seminal uh, stain is really a semen number three would be the acid acid phosphatase uh, test wherein the color that will appear that to, to indicate that a particular specimen is a semen would be purple color okay the violet so these are the You know, these are the various tests that can be performed, chemical examination that can be performed in determining whether a particular specimen is really a semen. Now, if the semen is still fresh, okay, if it is still fresh, you can conduct microscopic examination. So you get a, a, a spectro microscope and then you get the, the, the semen sample. You put it in the in a microscope and you examine. So if you can see the you know the tadpole like you know put tadpole like uh, um, things running or swimming on a particular fluid, this is an indication that this specimen is really a semen. So again, that's the third one: microscopic examination. Now, the fourth one and the last would be biological examination, which was 
uh, proposed, this test was pr proposed by Farnum in 1901. This test is also known as spermatoprecipitin, which is of great value in identification in certain cases like, for example, bestiality. Only a secretor can be determined by this test. What do you mean by bestiality? Bestiality is also the same with zoophilism. When we say zoo, that refers to animals. So when we say zoophilism or bestiality, that means the person has sexual intercourse with an animal or with animals. Okay? So in the determination thereof, you can use biological examination. Okay? Biological examination. That will also help determine whether that semen belongs to the human or that semen belongs to the animal. So we are already done with two physical evidences, the blood, examination of the blood, and the second one would be the examination of the semen. Now let us now move to the third physical evidence that can be subject for chemical process inside the crime lab. The physical evidence that we'll be uh, discussing next would be gunpowder and other explosives. So, in the investigation of crimes involving the use of firearms, three most important problems may arise. Number one, whether the person fired the gun. Number two, determination of the probable gunshot range. When you say probable gunshot range, the distance between the shooter and the victim. Number three, determination of the approximate time of firing of the gun. So this means you will determine what would be the possible time that the person pulled the trigger. Now, determining or determining the locations of the gunpowder residue would be quite easy, okay? Because usually what happens is the person will hold the gun and will pull the trigger. So basically, the first location that you have to take a look into would be the would be the hands of the person other possible locations would be on the residue of the barrel of the gun in or around the wound on the clothing of the person fired upon at the close range or on the exposed surface of the hand of the person firing the gun so basically these are the possible locations where you can find the GSR or the gunshot residue now um, in, the examina in the examination of the gunshot residue or the gunpowder residue, one very notable, very famous chemical test that can be conducted is what we know as the paraffin test. Okay? The paraffin test is a test to determine whether a person fired a gun or not with his bare hands. The positive result, deep blue specks develop when nitrates comes in contact with the phenylamine region that we will we will um, examine we will study or review how the paraffin test so the purpose again of the paraffin test is to find out whether the person fired the gun by examining the presence of the gunshot residue and the presence of the gunshot residue could be uh, indicated by the deep blue specks so let us now proceed on how the paraffin test can be can be made now the paraffin test what you need to do is to have a paraffin wax you melt the paraffin wax of course in a boiling pot in a boiling pot you melt the paraffin wax and then after the paraffin wax has already been melted you get a brush soak the brush in the melted paraffin wax and brush it on the suspect's hand but take note, people of the Philippines, do not pour the boiling paraffin melted wax on the hands of the suspect. Because what will happen is that he will really suffer burn on his hands if you will do that. So again, what you need to do is soak the brush on the melted paraffin wax and then try to cool it down a little and brush it on the hands of the person. After hardening, it is peeled off meaning once you are done brushing it several times you can see the paraffin paraffin um, paraffin cast uh, molded into the likeness of the hands the inner surface of the wax cast is then treated with the phenylamine or the phenylamine 
uh, Defenel Binsadayan region. So, this is, as you can see on your screen, in the picture, this is now the process of brushing the paraffin uh, wax to the hands of the person. And then, this is now the paraffin cast, the result. The paraffin cast is subjected to the chemical known, chemical known as the phenylamine or the phenyl, the phenyl benzodiazepine reagent. And once it is soaked with the phenylamine chemical, if there is a blue color or blue speaks that occur, then that means that the person is positive of the gunshot residue. Now, in the process of the paraffin test, one of the downside that we can take a look into would be the false positive. Okay? The false positive. I say false positive because even if the person even if the person did not fire the gun, did not pull the trigger, but if in case during the paraffin test or before the paraffin test, he was able to hold in any of these, for example, fertilizers, urine, okay, urine, explosives, cosmetics, tobacco, detergents. When you say detergents, I'm referring to whatever type of detergents, whether it is bar of any type, and fire crackers, okay? If he was able to touch these various materials, there can be false positive that will happen. So basically, even if he was not able to fire a gun, even if he was not able to pull the trigger, if he was able to, let us say, get in touch with the urine or his urine before he was before he under before he undergo paraffin test there is a big possibility that he will turn positive we call that one as false positive so this is one of the downside of the paraffin test so in my own opinion i think paraffin test should be should be abolished but this is one of the tests which is exclusively used in the philippines right now i think some other countries are considering this one as obsolete and is transferring to other form of test in knowing the gunshot residue. But in the Philippines, uh, in my own knowledge, still utilizes paraffin test, okay? In knowing or in determining whether the person fired a gun. Now, possibilities that a person may be found negative even if he actually fired a gun, Okay? Meaning, false negative ni siya. False negative. He fired a gun, but then again, taking a look on the examination, he was able to escape. Okay? He was able to escape from the tentacles of punishment. Punishment. Why? Because he was not found to have, he was not found to have the GSR. So, these are the possibilities. For example, use of automatic pistol. Okay? Because the use of automatic pistol will actually devoid the person from having the GSR. The direction of the wind. If, if there is strong gust of wind and you pull the trigger, there's a big possibility that the gunshot residue will flow from one place to the other and might not touch your uh, inner area of the hand or any part of your clothing. The wind velocity. Excessive perspiration, especially if the paraffin test has been conducted days after days after the incident so there's a big possibility that perspiration whatever that whatever gsr that penetrates on the on your pores might be excreted or might be extracted from your pores considering that you have excessive perspiration or the person uses gloves of course in this case the gunshot residue will be present on the gloves, but not on the hands of the person. Knowledge of chemicals that will remove the nitrate. Some would say vinegar could be a good chemical that can remove nitrate. But I'm not very sure about this, but this is just one of the theories, assumptions by other persons. Now, after performing the paraffin test, the next move that you are going to do is to determine the probable gunshot range. When you say gunshot range, this refers to the distance between the shooter and the victim. The question is, why do you have to determine the probable gunshot range? You have to know this in order to find out whether the specific incident involves murder or possibly suicidal. Because in suicidal, it would, be, it would be very impossible that the range would be, let us say, 5 meters. Usually, this range, the range 
uh, the range if it is suicidal would be very close. Okay? So if the range is very close, then that would indicate that possibly it could be suicidal. So the clothing of the victim with bullet perforations should be submitted for possible gunshot range. It is only possible to determine the probable gunshot range if the gun was fired from a distance of 0 to 36 inches, 3 feet. That means you cannot determine the gunshot range if it is above 3 feet. Because in reality, the gunshot residue cannot, okay, cannot reach to a particular point, to a particular surface. So if it is 5 feet, there's a big possibility that the gunshot residue will only travel within 3 feet and cannot reach to the surface of, of the, perhaps the, the surface or any parts of the victim. Now, I include here in the pictures, okay, the pictures that will help us understand the distance of firing. So let us take a look on 0 to 2 inches. So if it is 0 to 2 inches distance between the firer and the victim, you can see the gaping hole, the smudging, the tattooing, or the burning. So you can see, just like this one, this could be an indication of 0 to 2 inches. So you can see the gaping hole, the, 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 missy, the missy wound. If it is 2 to eight, 8 inches, you can see smudging or missy kind of uh, wound. If it is 8 to 36, you can say tattooing or gunshot tattooing. Okay? So, in the gunshot tattooing, uh, by the way, let's go first to the bottom. Beyond 36 inches, meaning evidence of powder tattooing is seldom present. So, if you will take a look on the first picture, if it is the distance between the gun and the victim, you can see the gunshot residue uh, very small. If it is in this corner, this is the second range, this is the gunshot residue uh, that appears to be bigger. It becomes bigger, it becomes bigger, and it becomes bigger as the distance goes along. So basically, the principle here is that um, the principle here is that um, the more distance, the more distance between the firer and the victim, the bigger would be the gunshot residue tattooing. I repeat. The higher the distance, the bigger would be the gunshot residue tattooing. So that's how, uh, that's the principle that is involved in the distance of firing. Now moving on, let us go now to another physical evidence that can be subject for chemical examination at the crime laboratory. Specifically the, the hair that can be found on the skin or, or in any part of the human body of the person usually of course usually the hair could be pointed and narrow okay pointed and narrow and then strays more or less the same now there are only two kinds of two kinds of hair number one is real hair number two is fuzz hair the real the real hair would refer to the hair on top of your head okay this one the fuzz hair generally short fine at times curly and woolly like for example pubic hair or your mustache could be a fuzz hair. Ang real hair again would be the hair on top of your head. Now, um, on the parts of the hair as you can see, okay, as you can see on the, as you can see on the picture on your screen, there are only three parts of the hair. Number one, the root. So, asa magsugod? Saan magsimula yung root? The root would be the portion embedding on the skin or embedding in the skin. So, the, the, the space or, or, or the, the root should be from this point, from this tip to this, to this part. The moment the hair embeds or penetrates the skin, the area of penetration or the area where it penetrated could be considered as the root. The shaft is the portion above the surface of the skin, most distinctive part of the skin. So meaning, naadrihan, nakalagay po yan, hair shaft from this point before the embedding or before the submerging of the root from this point to this point could be the shaft and at the tip or the other at the end point would be the tip of the hair 
Now, the shaft of the hair consists of layers. This may come out in the board examination, cadets. So, kindly familiarize yourselves with the three. Cuticle, cortex, and the medulla, or the core. The core, of course, would be the innermost uh, layer of the innermost layer of the hair. While at the outer layer would be the cortex. Okay? The cortex that will tell the race of the hair whether it is a negro, caucasian, mongoloid, whatever it is. Cortex. At the outside most, yung pinakalabas sa shaft is known as the cuticle. Tells whether human or animal hair. So these are the three layers. Again, at the outside part is the cuticle, inner would be cortex, at the innermost or at the core would be the medulla. So those are the parts of the shaft. Now, the hair can only be examined through microscopic examination. Okay? The microscopic examination. So what you need to consider in the microscopic examination would be the following. The color, the length, the character, the width or the breadth, the character of hair tip if present, the manner by which hair had been cut, condition of root or base or bulb of hair, char character of the cuticle, the cortex, presence of a hair dye in the hair, determination of whether naturally or artificially curled, or character of the medulla. All of these details should be noted upon microscopic examination of the hair. Take note also, the hair cont contains, at the root site, contains DNA. That can also be one of the very good ideal evidence to find out the culprit or the real perpetrator of the crime. Now, let us move now to textile fibers. Another physical evidence that can be subject for chemical examination. Let us take a look first at the definition of textile fibers. It is derived from Latin word textilis and the French texteri meaning to wave. Hence, textile fiber means that can be converted into yarn. Now, the textile fibers are classified into, um, into three, or uh, into two rather. Number one is natural fibers, meaning these are fibers from vegetables, animals, or minera minerals. While when we say synthetic, these are fibers that are man-made. Okay? Man-made. So the synthetic fibers could be organic, uh, organic, uh, organic uh, in a sense that it can be cellu cellulosic or non-cellulosic. Or it can be in organic which can be classified as mineral or metallic. So basically there are only two natural and synthetic fibers. Natural in a sense that it is a natural fiber. Meaning these are fibers that does not involves intervention of man. But if it is man-made, you can consider it as synthetic fibers. Now, in the examination of the fibers, we have four, basically. Okay? We have four basic. Examination, chemical examination, and microscopic examination of textile fibers. Number one would be the burning or ignition test. So, the burning or ignition test is a kind of test that will determine whether the fiber is mineral, animal, or vegetable. Okay? Vegetable. Of course, the vegetable fiber is easily burned compared to the former ones. The second test would be the fluorescence test. If it is a vegetable fiber, it will exhibit a yellow fluorescence in ultraviolet light, whereas animal fibers show bluish fluorescence. So that's the second test that can be performed. The third test, which is very reliable, could be microscopic examination. Um, this is considered as the most reliable and best means of identifying fiber, the microscopic examination as compared to the former ones. The last would be the chemical analysis of fibers. We have number one, the staining test. The, the second one is dissolution test. Now, the staining test, only animal fibers react with picric acid and melons regent while vegetable fibers react with stannic chloride. These are chemicals that can be utilized. In dissolution test, wool and silk were dissolved in NaOH while cotton line, linen Wild silk and 
sick cell does not. So these are these are technical terms in chemistry that can be, you know, you know, chemicals that can be used to test chemically the textile fiber. After textile fiber, you can we can also take a look on another physical evidence, specifically the glass, that can also be considered as an evidence to prove the guilt or innocence of the suspect. The glass, in its definition, is a supercooled liquid which possesses high viscosity and rigidity. It is a non-crystalline inorganic substance. So, as you can see on your screen, this is the composition of the glass. The oxide like silica, the boric oxide, the phosphorus pentoxide. I will not dwell more on this, guys. I will not more on this on the. I uh, will not dwell more on this in the composition of glass. But uh, you can just take a look, or you can just acquit yourselves with the composition: the silica, the boric oxide, and the phosphorus pentoxide. So in the crime laboratory, there are basically five analyses that can be utilized in. The examination of glass. Number one would be spectrographic test. Okay, in determining the presence of trace elements, this is a this is this picture depicts the process spectrographic test. The second one would be X-ray diffraction test by using this instrument. Not as effective as spectrographic analysis. It determines the type of pattern of glass. The type of pattern depends upon the composition of the glass. So aside from spectrographic test and x-ray diffraction test, we also have physical properties examination. So this is the most sensitive method of determining the composition of the glass samples. Okay? So this can be done by density, done by flotation method, a rapid and convenient method of determining the density of small glass fragments or number two the physical properties examination can be done through refractive index immersion so that's the difference between the two density flotation refractive would be immersion method the fourth one would be ultraviolet light examination in order to determine the differences in appearance of the fluorescence does indication of physical and chemical properties and the last one would be polish marks optical glass and other glassware are usually polished in order to find out the characteristics or the peculiarity of the characteristics of that glass uh, as compared to other glass uh, physical evidence now, the broken glass can only be typed or classified into regal crack or concentric crack. So, as you can see on the figure or on the picture that I integrated in the slide, the, uh, the, regal, crack, uh, the regal crack is usually right at a right angle. Okay? Regal crack at a right angle. Say, so for example, this one and this one right angle. Okay? Can be an example as regal fractures. If a particular fracture or broken glass is shaped into circular, okay, circular formation, the circular formation is known as the concentric fracture. I repeat, if it is, if it is like a line, like like right angle, it can be considered as regal fracture. But if the broken glass is shaped in a circular or oval in nature that can be classified as concentric crack. Now, the next physical evidence would be the foot impression and tool impression. Now, let us first differentiate between impression and imprint. If a particular print is strong or a strong, considered as a strong mark, Okay, a strong mark produced by pressure that goes below the surface. Ang tawag ani, impression. But if the mark does not penetrate below the surface, it can only be considered as a weak mark or an imprint. I repeat, the difference between the two is that impression, the mark is 
submerging or the the mark is below the surface the mark is considered as uh, considered to be strong impression but if the mark is considered to be weak and does not have the pressure uh, that goes below the surface it can be considered as an imprint now so in, in the foot impression and tool impression we have the so-called mollage or casting material that could be the basis for the examination so mollage is the faithful reproduction of an impression with the use of casting material this is an example of this one a casting material that is used in the mollage the casting material could be any material which can be changed from plastic or liquid state of the solid condition like say for example just, just like a while ago the paraffin wax can be considered as a casting material okay that's how the foot impression or the tool impression can be can be examined the next thing would be metallurgy as applied to crime detection now let us differentiate between metallurgy and metallography because this also came out in the board examination in the past so in the same metallurgy the art of extracting and working on metals made by the application of chemical and physical knowledge while metallography metallography is a branch of metallurgy that involves the study of the microstructures of metals and alloys so meaning metallurgy or metallography rather metallography is just a branch of metallo uh, metallurgy okay metallurgy rather metallurgy so metallurgy is generic in a sense that it involves on the process of working or examining or extracting on the metals but if it involves the study on the microstructure the diminutive structure or details of the metal that shall be under the study of metallography now it is important that uh, we need to study the metal metallography or the metallurgy simply because this can be very applicable especially on the following cases for example robbery robbery that involves metals for example ang tampered uh, serial number of the motor vehicle that could be part of metallurgy theft hit and run, the bomb explosion, restoration of tampered serial numbers, nail examination, and the counterfeiting of coins. Like say, for example, in this picture, you can easily see that, uh, you can easily spot that the coin is actually counterfeited based on the details. So by the direct uh, examination of the naked eye, you can actually spot directly that there is something wrong with the two coins. And uh, metallurgy can be one of the good, um, ideal ex chemical examination that can be utilized in the, in the counterfeiting of coins. Now, counterfeit coins are basically coins that are imitated. And the purpose would be on the monetary gain. Okay? This is very common. But take, take note, cadets, that counterfeiting of the currency or coins of the country even if you will commit it on the other nation in the principle of in the principle of territoriality still you are not exempted you will still be executed or you will still be prosecuted in the philippine court even if you committed the counterfeiting in other countries so usually it's for monetary gain so the coins can be classified into cast coins or struck coins as far as reproduction is concerned if the coins are made through molding, ang tawag niya ay cast coins. If it is made by stamping, like what you can see on the figure or what you can see on the pictures, that can be considered as struck coins. That's, that's the difference between the two. Now, in the tampered serial numbers, okay, in the tampered serial numbers, which can be part of metallurgy, this is one way of examining or one way of uh, knowing that the person committed robbery okay but the question right now is how will you restore the tampered serial number it's very simple what you need to do under the chemical process you just have to apply an etching fluid an etching fluid is a fluid that can restore the tampered serial numbers like say for example as what as what you can see on your screen 
In this picture, this is a tampered serial number. But once you subject this tampered serial number, alright, subject this one to an itching fluid, you can see that the numbers already sprouted out or the numbers of the serial, uh, the, the serial number started to appear. So, itching fluid is very effective in restoring the tampered serial number. Now, let us move now to the soil. Okay? The soil. I think we are now on the second to the last topic of forensic chemistry and toxicology. Soil can also be one of the physical evidences that can be examined. So let us find out the definition of petrography. Petrography is the branch of geology that deals with the systematic classification and identification of rocks, rock forming minerals, and soil. Question is, why is soil examination important? Now, as I have said in the previous topics, there might be instances that you can get a tracing evidence. For example, if the person was, uh, if the person committed rape in a, in a certain location, perhaps the soil that is deposited, the soil that is deposited on his shoes will be an indication that the person was present in that place was present in that location when the crime committed because of the soil that is deposited on the shoes or on the slipper of the suspect. And that could be a tracing evidence. So soil examination is still very important. But first and foremost, we will go first with the types of soil. I think this was also taken in our elementary and high school uh, discussion. There are only three types of soil. The alluvial, colluvial, and the sedentary soil. If the soil is alluvial, this means these are soils that are washed out. Okay, washed out. For example, on the on the cliff, or at the bottom side of the cliff, you can see alluvial soil because the so that soil is washed out from the cliff. Colluvial, if it is the soil that is coming from the Various types of rock like igno, sedimentary, or metamorphic rocks. Oh, this is an example. Oh, this cliff contains of various rocks, and the bottom portion, bottom portion consists of the soil known as colluvial soil. In a sense that this soil comes from the particles. Okay, particles from this rock. If the soil is inactive or migrat not migratory, meaning constantia in one place, we call that one as sedentary soil also in our high school we discuss about different types of rock let us just review cadets this is very simple igneous rock we call it one in Cebuano as buhi nga bato but in reality this is not this is the stone that, that is the stone is not actually breathing but we call it as buhi nga bato because it is a hard rock igneous rock ang tawag mesomorphic rock if it is a rock that is textural in, it has contains texture, a beautiful texture, like limestone or marble. Okay, limestone or marble, we call that one as metamorphic rock. Patay nga bato in Cebuano dialect, we call it as, patay na bato in English, we call it as sedimentary rock containing the sandstone, which is a rock formed by various sediments. Now, in the examination thereof, in order for you to distinguish the particles or the characteristics of appearance of these soil properties or rock properties, you can uh, utilize the so-called density gradient apparatus. Okay? So, this is the apparatus that can be used in determining the appearance or the characteristics of the particles. Now, let us examine these terms. Dust and dirt matters in the wrong place. Dust Matter which is dry and in finely divided form. Mud, dust mixed with water. Gri the, the grime or heavy dirt. When dust is mixed with the sweat and the graces of the human body, this is form. Now, in the classification of dust, you have, this is very simple and very understandable. Dust deposited from the air, road and footpath, uh, footpath dust. 
industrial dust that came from industrial uh, establishments, and occupational dust which are finely powdered material found in clothing or footwear. So these are the different classification of dust. The last physical evidence that I want to take into in this episode would be the deoxyribonucleic acid or the DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is hereditary in nature. So meaning the DNA that is present from your parents could also be present within you because this is hereditary. So in DNA analysis, you can find DNA samples coming from the blood or blood stain, the semen, the hair, the saliva, the bones, the organs, tissues, and cells. All of this, as long as it comes from the body, even the sweat, contains DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. And if it is examined, that can pinpoint the identity of the person. Even on the cases of catastrophic, ev e catastrophic evidences, like say for example, shipwreck, tapos you can no longer identify the person. DNA identification or DNA testing could help identify the individual. Now, these are only few of the cases where DNA can be utilized. Sexual assault, like rape, like you examine the semen, the DNA of the semen, the murder, homicide, robbery, hit and run, extortion, even on paternity cases, and of course, identification of the remains of mass disasters. So DNA is very, very useful. Now, if we will compare between fingerprint identification and DNA, fingerprint identification is also reliable. But between the two, DNA can be more, the most reliable between the uh, fingerprint and DNA. Because DNA is more stable. DNA can be destroyed from wide variety of biological resources like blood, can be destroyed rather. DNA can be destroyed from wide variety of biological resources like blood, semen, hair, saliva, and bone. Unlike fingerprint, that you only have to extract the, the, the printing coming from the hands of the person. But in DNA, wh wherever that sample came from, as long as it came from the body of the suspect, that can be examined. DNA can be replicated in the laboratory for a very small amount of initial material through the process of polymerase chain reaction. DNA shows greater variability from one individual to the next, meaning the peculiarity of the DNA can be obtained from one person to the other, making DNA more reliable compared to other evidences. Now, the chemical process that is involved in the examination of DNA is called DNA typing. Now, in the DNA typing, what is being done is that the DNA is extracted from the specimen samples coming from the site coming from the crime scene. Then after the DNA is extracted from the samples, the DNA will then be realized and uh, will then be analyzed rather. Will then be analyzed in order to find out the pattern. Okay? For for or uh, for uh, paternal cases or family feud, knowing the identity of the parent you can actually see that there is the same pattern between the parent and the child. So if there is no same similarity in the pattern, then that means that the person does not own the, 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 the child, biologically speaking. Now, the pattern is then compared again from one individual to, other, to, the, to the other in order to find out the match. This is how DNA typing is being executed. So again, um, DNA is very useful since, uh, since this is very reliable in crime scene investigation. The last one would be forensic toxicology. Now, when we say toxicology, this is the branch of science that treats poison, their origin, physical and chemical properties, physiological action, and treatment of their noxious effect and methods of detection. Toxicology comes from the word toxico, that means poison, and ology meaning study or science. So basically, toxic 
toxico poison logi study meaning toxicology is the study of poison now the poison is the substance that if introduced to the body could cause a noxious effect and even death on the part of the individual posology on the other hand is the science that deals with the study of dosage the quantity of medicine we say dosage that is the quantity of medicine that can be administered to the body of the person now as to the types of poisoning there are only two generally speaking one is from the medical point of view which can be acute poisoning sub-acute poisoning or chronic poisoning from the legal point of view poisoning can be accidental we say accidental that means you do not have intention to take the poison suicidal poisoning especially those persons who are suffering from depression they take like say muriatic acid or too much medicines so that can be considered as suicidal or homicidal poisoning wherein the person with this intention put a poison or a toxin on the drinks of the victim tawag niya it could be homicidal poisoning or the case can be considered as murder and the last one would be undetermined type of poisoning now in terms of action of poisons we have three it could be local remote or combined local refer to the changes produced on the part with which the poison comes in contact for example um, in the case of uh, in the case of uh, being poisoned by a fish so in the local action of poisoning katong fish that has in contact with the part of the body uh, will destroy the organs of that part of that body and that can be considered as local remote if changes produced in distant parts away from the site of application like for example you only suffer the the ill effects of the poison at your fingers or on your hands only that can be considered as remote combined if the effect of poison is not only localized at the site but also affects other organs or remote organs so these are the differences between the three local remote and combined lastly in the investigation of fatal cases that involves poisoning it has been stated here that the investigator is not should is not necessarily an expert on poisons because in the process of the investigation thereof you you can ask assistance as an as an investigator po that you can ask assistance coming from the medical legal or coming from the toxicologist but what is imperative in the investigation is that you should know or you should note the following because all of this can be very helpful in the determination of the case okay so number one is that in your investigation report you should know the various are the symptoms of various kinds of poisoning and of course you should know the lethal dose of poisoning the length of the time that may elapse after the poison has been taken where the poison was obtained the chemical formula of the poison other names it is uh, it is known in the market and the uses of poison all of these details should be noted by the criminal investigator even if the criminal investigator is not expert on toxicology at least at this point because in a way at the end of the day the assistance of the medical legal and toxicologists as the expert witnesses okay as the expert witnesses of on this part should be should be attained all you have to do is to seek assistance coming from coming from them so cadets those are the topics that are under the forensic chemistry and toxicology subject the subject is again uh, one of the courses under forensic science and this is considered as the most one of the most difficult uh, uh, subjects in taking the criminology licensure examination so i hope in this episode i was able to give you supplementary learning uh, on the area of forensic chemistry and, the, and I just hope this is one way of helping you uh, passing the future criminology licensure examination. Happy learning 
God bless you and stay safe.